and welcome to the left wing. Well, coming up, the Ireland squad for the Autumn Nation series will be announced on Wednesday. Leo Cullen looks set to sign a new two-year deal with Leinster and it's the final round of games this weekend before a four-week break in the URC. I'm Sinead Kassan and I'm sitting in for Will Slattery. Luke Fitzgerald and Keen Tracy are here. You're welcome and welcome back, Keen. Um, you've had a busy, life-changing month. Many congratulations. Thank you, Sinead. Yeah, um, became a dad for the first time in the last few weeks. So a bit of a break, a welcome break uh, from work to get to new, get to used to the new reality, I suppose. But yeah, so far, so good anyway. But good to good to be back in the pod with you, lads. Miss you. Have you been have you been getting much sleep, Keen, or how has that end been going? For fear that my wife might hear this, I my sleep is going perfectly. It's definitely not the time for me to be to be giving out about uh, stuff like that. But yeah, first day back today. Uh, I suppose it'll take a bit of adjustment, but I suppose that the all hybrid working from home uh, really does help. You can still give the the hand in the house, as I'm sure you know all too well, Luke. <laughs> Certainly does help, all right. <laughs> Any advice for him? There said about the door. What was it? An old boss of mine said, uh, what, what was the expression? It was, uh, it's the, the long trudge home and the skip out the door in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> but uh i know it's great congratulations of them um, i'm sure we'll, we'll we'll chat offline but uh yeah great to have you back but also um i think you're right it's nice to spend a couple of weeks just getting everyone i think i know acclimatize is the wrong word but it's probably pretty probably pretty apt <laughs> yeah uh, you're back back just in time keen as well uh mm. for the build-up to the november test of course um so as i said at the top there the ireland squad for the autumn nation series will be announced on wednesday afternoon we are recording this on tuesday before that squad um is announced obviously there's an injury issue there at hooker um we'll get into that later luke but outside of the normal crew luke um is there anyone you believe should be in this squad going off what we've seen so far in the urc this season um well, you will hope they pick someone uh, Sinead. <laughs> um but um no i think uh, just i presume you're talking about the the young guns um yeah like i'd say um i think it's a chuku but i don't know if that's actually a an unusual one at this stage i i, I really like him um so fitness per you know uh, f- fitness permitting I, i'd like to see him in there i think um I think um, I really like Ben Murphy. I think Murphy's a really nice mm-hmm. player, isn't he? Yeah, and he's playing well. I mean, he difficult difficult day at the office against Leinster. That was a very difficult performance uh, team to play against. And uh, kicking in the first half was that wind was really difficult to kick into, and he struggled a little bit there. But I look, I think anyone would if you've got uh, Orgy Snyman kind of hanging on the side of the rock, and you have to try and kick over him and try and get a bit distance. So, um, but he's one who's played really well all like so far this season, um. And who else really kind of um there the, look good to see Thomas O'Hearn back. I know it's kind of all like guys in similar positions, but I think he's a re- he could be a big player for Ireland, um, provided he stays injury free as well. Uh, I really like the look of himself and his Achuku, both brilliant athletes, both good height, um, you know, very destructive ball carriers. Um, and I think big players for for their respective teams, and they'll get big minutes if they stay injury free. So um, they're they're the three that kind of stick stick out in my mind, to be honest with you, Sinead. What about you, Keen? Are we expecting any kind of curveballs? Uh, I don't think so, to be honest. Uh, I think we can take it as a given. Uh, it could look silly saying this before the squad is out, but that Cormac Izzichuku and Sam Prendergast are going to be in the squad. I'm fully expecting them to make their debuts. I don't think it would be that would be a big shock when you look at the amount of time and effort I suppose that Ireland and the provinces have put into those two guys in particular going on the summer tour okay they didn't get to feature but uh, they featured heavily on obviously the recent uh, emerging Ireland tour Um, other than injuries I think Sinead which obviously we're not privy to the likes of like is Peter O'Mahony going to be fit enough to be named in the squad if he isn't I think it'll be very interesting because you'd obviously expect Caelan Doris maybe to take over as Ireland captain and that could really be this sort of the line in the sand moment going forward. So that will be one to watch. I think there's another couple of injuries which will dictate if possibly new guys get in. Uh, I'm thinking of Ollie Yeager and Jeremy Lockman, two Munster props, um, in particular, who've been in around the, the Ireland squad for the last couple of years. You know, if if 
Jaeger isn't fit. He's been out with a neck injury. Does someone like Jack Anger come in who's been playing well for Connacht and was obviously on that emerging tour um, as well? Like, I, I don't think in the main squad we'll see too many changes, if I'm being honest. Um, I will be interested to see if there are any training panelists or whatever you want term you want to use. I think there's definitely merit in, in having that. I think guys like... Um, Alfa Ford, who I think has been really good for for Connacht uh, over the weekend, will or over the course of the, the start of the season and last season. To be fair, I think probably worth getting into him a little bit more, maybe in in the chat. But what position he's going to end up playing? He reminds me a lot of um, Kieran Frawley, um, who of course has an injury doubt as well. But my understanding about Frawley is, and Leinster kind of alluded to this yesterday, is that he's hoping to be out for two weeks max, which would mean he should be fit in time for that All Blacks game in a couple of weeks. It looks like Sam Prendergast actually is going to start this weekend at the Aviva against the Lions, which will be very interesting. But another couple of guys who I think would be worth a shot um, as training panelists would be James Culhan, I think, has been very good for Leinster. Jude Postlethwaite in the centre up in Ulster. Looks like uh, Stuart McCloskey kind of uh, part two. So they've been pretty exciting. And obviously the hooker scenario, Sinead, is going to dictate whether we'll see a fresh face in there. You obviously have injury concerns. Dan Sheehan won't play a part. We already know that. Ronan Keller, even if he's named in the squad, might not be fit till later on. The soundings out of Ulster seem to be pretty positive, certainly more positive than they had been on Rob Herring and Tom Stewart. Um, But you could see Dave Heffernan getting a recall or someone like Gus McCarthy, who I think has been playing really well for Leinster. I know he's super young and was playing 20s uh, only last year, but if he's not going to be in the full squad, which would be understandable if they have enough fit bodies on board, I think there's a lot to... There's a lot to like about getting him into the squad and learning um the ropes in the senior setup too. Yeah, I would absolutely think uh, Gus McCarthy has been uh, going pretty well, Luke, hasn't he? Considering the yeah, injuries, he has, you know. Look, the temptation though is probably like Dave Heffernan was good too on the weekend. Yeah. Oh, I mean, yeah. Gus McCarthy, look, he looks like a good athlete. He's a young guy. Could be a bit of value in just keeping him at Leinster for a couple more weeks, you know, uh, and getting him settled in. I'm sure Leinster would probably prefer that as well, just given, mm-hmm. you know, uh, it seems like they're a little bit unsure about how quickly Kelleher gets back from that knock. So, um, yeah, no, look, I was impressed with him. Uh, there was one he should have, there was one he should have passed, I thought, to, um, oh, I don't know who was on his outside, actually. I can't remember. Uh, could possibly have been Frawley. I'm not sure, but they made a break. And there's one he held that I really didn't like, but, um, I'm being really picky. Uh, look, he, he struggled a little bit, but it was very difficult conditions um, in, in the sports ground, uh, throwing-wise, uh, particularly in the first half. But um, look, he got enough there that, that I was saying, okay, well, look, you could definitely bring him in. But mm-hmm. if you're asking me, I'm thinking, you know, steady hand at the tiller. It's such an important position. I'm hoping Herring gets back and I think Heffernan will probably be my number two. You, you miss a lot with those guys just in, in terms of what you're comparing to just for pure power. You think about what Sheehan brings and he's obviously, you know, he, he probably gets, I don't know, rightly or wrongly on, on this one. I, it, is it a big call? Um, I think he might be in a World 15 for me at two. He's so good, I think, mm-hmm. um, around the pitch. Um, it's certainly close to that uh, kind of quality. And I think, you know, um, you know, Kelleher as well, great power, and they're so good in the loose. And it's a big part of what Ireland do is to have players who are good in the loose. I think Heffernan's good, I think Herring are good in the loose, but you're losing a little bit there, Sinead. But you might get something back in the set piece, maybe, you know. So, um, uh, yeah, I- I'd love to see those two guys get opportunities. I think they're they're kind of grizzled enough veterans, but they're still playing very well. And I think they'd be my selection, my first two in that slot anyway. And I might have Gus McCarty in pro- probably uh, in that maybe training-y type role, Green maybe to get a flavour yeah. of the environment. Just to come in on that, I think... Um... It's worth remembering that there's an extra game going to be in November. Uh, like normally there's three games in November. There's going to be an extra one. And I think like, okay, like the All Blacks first up, we're going to fully expect Ireland to be full metal jacket. But the game against Fiji in particular, no disrespect to Fiji, but at some stage, you know, Andy Farrell is obviously going to head off to the Lions after this month. But um, at some stage, we are going to have to see a bit of, you know, a, a new blood introduced. And while I think he's done that really well over the last couple of years, it won't be long before the Six Nations is upon us and everyone will be wanting to see, you know, the full Ireland team being rolled out. So if you're not going to do it in November games against the likes of Fiji, then when are you going to do it? And that's where I would expect the likes of a Sam Prendergast, Cormac is a Chuku, but Kieran Frawley needs game time as a starting 10 as well. So I don't think it's a, a foregone conclusion that we're going to see Sam Prendergast start that game because I think it's important to get Frawley some minutes from the start here as well. So that's why guys like 
it, it could be too soon for Gus McCarthy. I'm just using him as an mm-hmm. example. But guys like Tom O'Hearn, I'd really like to see mm-hmm. them getting game time because that's what these November internationals should be about. What do you think there about what uh, Keane said earlier, Luke, about, you know, we have to wait and see what the story is with uh, Peter Mahoney's fitness. But but should tomorrow be the day um, that Andy Farrell announces that permanent captain to take Ireland up to the next World Cup? And if that is Caelan Doris? Look, that's the ideal scenario, I think, is that you get a bit of certainty there. You get someone to settle into the role. They're kind of, you know, they're they're not finding their way by the time the kind of big competition comes around. And you think Six Nations, I'm, I'm loath to say World Cup, but, um, uh, you know, I think it will be, it, the earlier you get someone in there, the more settled they are, you know, the, I think the better the job you do, it, for, for that job particularly, experience, you know, really is, uh, re- really does help you, I think. So, um, yeah, there's there's some merit to that maybe. And also it might take some pressure off Pete. I don't think it's, see, I don't think there's any reason why you can't pick him still, even mm. if he's not your captain, you know, um, Three years is probably a long enough, you know, I think he'd be doing well just given how physical he is and, and where his body is. Like, look, he's still getting around the pitch and all that, still very, uh, you know, athletic. You can see that, you know, when, when he's playing from from his uh, work on the line out. Um, so he hasn't lost that much of a step, I don't think, which is pretty impressive uh, given how physical he is. But, you know, three years, I think is a big ask just the way he plays the game. So um, I'd say it might be a good time to do that now, take a bit of pressure off him. And I don't think it means you can't select him because he can still be a massive leader for you in there. And he's still playing very well, I think, whenever he's playing. So, um, yeah, it might be a time that, that that's an interesting um, mm. comment, Sinead. Yeah, and um, I'm sure the coaches have given it some thought. Yeah, absolutely. And Keen, you mentioned there about the out half. Jack Crowley had a very challenging game in Cape Town last weekend, and he probably made mistakes that you know he might make a ver- repeat uh, very rarely again in the future. And like we spoke last week about that gap between himself and Kieran Frawley, Luke, didn't we? Where, where do you think it is now, Keen? Uh, look, I think Jack Crowley and Andy yeah. Farrell's mind is comfortably Ireland's first choice ten. I think you look at the body of work that he's put together particularly in helping Ireland win the Six Nations and, you know, like stepping into Johnny Sexton's boots and winning a Six Nations title and not very much being made of it, I think was probably the biggest compliment you could give Jack Crowley. He didn't come in and shoot the lights out. He played really well um, and he fitted into the system rather than trying to be a hero and, you know, play miracle passes, which is what actually what I think he did at the weekend. He was really starting to force things behind what was a beaten pack. And I know we can get in and talk about the performance, but it is very difficult for any nine or 10. Lou touched on Ben Murphy there and Joshua Anne was the same against Leinster at the weekend. They really struggled to get any sort of control against uh, behind a pack that was going backwards, really. So, um, Look, I think in Andy Farrell's mind, Sinead, like what Jack Crowley has done in a green jersey counts for a hell of a lot. And of course, we can say that about Kieran Frawley as well, the composer composure he showed in South Africa. And it's worth remembering as well that for a long time, Andy Farrell has seen Kieran Frawley as a 10. And I know we've spoken about it so often on this podcast. And it finally seems that Leo Cullen and Leinster, that the penny has dropped for them as well. But in Andy Farrell's case, he's seen this from a long way out. And it's just been a case of um, several different injuries, which ironically is what happened to Kieran Frawley now again. But like, look, hopefully it's not too serious. So um, look, it's great to have that bit of competition because you don't want a scenario whereby anyone feels like that they're guaranteed a place in the team uh, no matter what. And I think a couple of years on from Johnny Sexton's retirement, it's brilliant now that you have a scenario where Jack Crowley, as I said, I think is still Ireland's first choice 10, but he does have now a legitimate rival in Kieran Frawley. If of course Leinster continue to pick him at 10 which I think all the evidence that you've seen from so far this season both in terms of the team selections and how well that he's played even in the the cameo he had at the weekend before he went off injured that I don't think it's a coincidence that Leinster's attack has looked uh, much better this season when he's been playing 10 much better structure and shape to to what they're doing so I think it's a win-win all around but I think come that All Blacks game Sinead in a couple of weeks I think Jack Crowley is and should certainly be the Ireland 10. Yeah, can I come in on that? I just, I think, um, I agree with Keane. I think he's done enough. I think he's been really like pretty much everything you've said there. I agree. I, I, I do think though, um, I think he's got to get his kicking sorted. Um, you know, that's something that at international level, you know, can really, really hurt you badly. You need to be very, very, um, you know, solid there. I don't think you need to be, you know, 
you don't always need to be an 85%, 90% goal kicker. That's great if you are, but you do need to be trucking over the 80. And there was a few big, you know, I think there was one against Leinster as well. I thought he should have put over the bar. Um, there was one, like even the one on the weekend where Munster go 12 up instead of 14. It kind of did impact them a little bit as well, you know, and it does impact decisions that you make elsewhere in the game. Look, the obvious ones are silly mistakes at the end where he has the two drop go, drop go drop-offs that don't go 10. Um but look, I think that's just a, a bad day at the office. And the, and the flick out the back, look, he took a chance. I thought Haley did. Like, he, he kind of got... The shape wasn't great for the pass. He got out the back. He got held up a little bit. It was behind him. Look, I think a guy like him, what he's been really good at for, you know, the last year and a half, two years, probably even a little bit longer, is that he's been really solid and that he hasn't thrown those kind of passes, even if he has the ability to do it. It comes out kind of rarely. For the most part, he's a very solid decision maker. Uh, he's been excellent in an Ireland jersey. He's a very brave tackler. I really like that about him. And he's a bit of a threat with the ball in hand. So he's got the full package to me, similar to Frawley. He's got to get the kicking off the deck sorted. That's the one thing I've noticed that no one's really been talking about the last couple of weeks. They're ones that can kind of just get away and they're not, like, they're not gimme kicks, but they're kicks that no, a, a, a good goal kicker should be getting. They're in areas where you should be over 90% kicking them and he's just missed a few of them. And I just think it's a little bit... I, if I was a coach, I'd be watching that saying, okay, well, look, let's, we need to have a word here or we need to watch that and make sure it's not something that, that, that he brings into the international camp as well. So, um, yeah, he, he's my guy too. I agree with pretty much everything that Keane said, but he's got to get that little part of his game sorted because that puts pressure on the team if you're not getting the, the ones that you should get. He's bounced back from that before though, Keane, hasn't he? Crowley. He has, yeah. Like one of one of the biggest strengths uh, of Jack Crowley is, I think, his mental fortitude. Mm-hmm. And I think back to his performance. I know you were there as well, Sinead, in Marseille, the first night of the Six Nations. Like that was a proper hostile cauldron, and he was exceptional that night. And I just think, like I mentioned, he's been forcing things, and it's probably been this will, like I'm sure, lead into the chat about Munster, but it's probably been a little bit indicative of Munster. I think as a whole, um, obviously I haven't been on with you guys in a few weeks, but it, like even watching the going back to the Leinster game, I saw similar problems against the Stormers at the weekend where it seemed to me that um, obviously the Leinster and the Stormers both play in a really aggressive blitz defence. And it seemed to me that Munster obviously had planned to go wide as soon as possible. And that was like their, their pre-planned thing, which makes total sense. But I think you've got to play the picture that unfolds in front of you as as well. And I think Jack Crowley generally does that so well in terms of scanning the the picture uh, that's unfolding. Like I said, again, I think back to that little kick or the pass that he had for, I think it was Ty Byrne that night in, in Marseille. Just exceptional scanning of the space. But Lou touched on it there, like flinging that pass at the weekend out to where Calvin Nash okay, it was supposed to be, but he was in at the ruck. But like Jack Crowley should be looking up there to see what's on and is it not on. And tro- like throwing passes into touch, I think they did it against Leinster as well. And I think you just have to have a little bit more composure. I was I, on the Munster press conference call today with mm-hmm. Graham Rowntree and that's something, look, the, the line out, we'll get, get on to talk about the line out, but something that he's been really, I'd say, pissed off with is their execution under pressure. Uh, well, um, missed opportunity as well. We didn't pass to Tom or Hearn. There's just been several different, uh, I think, scenarios where Munster's brains have been probably scrambled. And that's a result. And it's probably something that not a lot gets spoken about in terms of what the rush defense does to you. And Leinster did it brilliantly. And the Stormers did it too. It forces you into making errors that you wouldn't normally do. And I think that's what we've seen from Jack Crowley. Look, I've got no doubt that like this is only a bit of a blip again. He's playing behind a pack that is really struggling. I think if you put Jack Crowley into that Leinster team behind the Leinster pack, yeah. the performances they played over the last couple of weeks, then you don't have the similar issues. The kicking aside, which I have to admit, I do agree with Luke. I think that is becoming um, a bit of an issue. But um, look, it's a big game for Munster this weekend, obviously against the Sharks and no better place to, to bounce back because I think the last thing you want for a guy like Jack Crowley is to be going into international camp, uh, going to Portugal next week on the back of three pretty sobering defeats, if that was to be the case um, this weekend. So it's a big game for Munster this weekend, but I think it's also a big game for the likes of Jack Crowley and someone like Ty Byrne, who I think is under a little bit of pressure as well to sort out the lineout. 
I, can I say one thing? I, I actually just, because just to go on to the Munster game, we may as well, I suppose, mm -hmm. at this stage, if, if that's okay, Sinead. I, I do think they actually, the scoreline was a little bit flattering to the Stormers. I actually thought Munster played quite well for large periods of it. Yes, a little wasteful. Yes, there's a few tackles you're saying, okay, you sh probably should have made that one. Um, but for the most part, they were very much in that game. Just some kind of silly errors, I think, at times. And, uh, you know, when they got going backwards, you know, particularly that little period at the end of the game, you know, they never really recovered. They made a lot of kind of, you know, they gave away momentum or never got any momentum um, at, at periods when they needed it. And um, they kind of shipped tries quite badly in those periods. And, um, you know, they did that against Leinster too. Um, but um, look, I actually didn't think it was that bad a performance. I thought they, like, obviously line out creaked a little. Um, but that game was in the balance for 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 quite a number of periods, uh, quite, quite, quite a long time, I thought, actually. And um, yeah, the, the key thing for them now is that they, they back up what I thought you can correct me if I'm wrong if if you think uh differently, Keen, but I actually thought they played quite well. They need to have a big performance against the Sharks now. You know, that's really, really important. I think they back it up that they and and if they got away, if they snuck away with a win, I don't think this this little period looks as bad, even though the score lines weren't great for them during, in, in the middle of a Sinead. So it's not all doom and gloom for me, but they do need a few wins and they they still that issue around their defense need to get it sorted. They're just a little bit too open for me against the good teams and they're getting picked apart. Uh, and if they can if they can be a little bit more accurate in their um in their execution in attack, um I I, st I think this Munster team is a good shot at the league again. I think they'll be there in the late stages. I I actually like them when they've got everyone out, but um need to stop kind of making it more difficult for for themselves than they are at the moment. The line out though, Keen, as you mentioned, I mean, is it not approaching almost a, a crisis point now? A 57% success rate against the Stormers. They're the 16th team out of 16 teams when it comes to the line out. They're bottom of that stats table, um, only a 79% success rate so far. Like, that is like, what are the factors at play here, do you think? Like they lost, was it five lineouts against Leinster and another six against the Stormers? Like that's really, really poor. Like Sinead, as you've just outlined there, they have the worst uh, lineout record in the URC. I think last season, I'm open to correction, they might have had the 13th worst um, lineout as well. So, um, or they were ranked 13 out of 16, I should, mm -hmm. I should say. So this isn't exactly... Um, a new problem look they've got plenty of injuries and like the de the sense of deja vu is so strong here when we're talking about Munster because we you could be playing this podcast from this time last year in terms of having a lengthy injury list and of course that does uh, play into it but that said they do have their first choice uh, locks in Jean Klein and Ty Byrne they brought Tom Ahern in last weekend who's a big big unit and a good line out operator as well but uh, the Stormers were just able to pick it apart and this is something that I've been writing about because I was asking Graham Roundtree um, about it today and look he feels that it's their issues that are in Munster's control that you know it's kind of the usual story in that it's not just down to the hooker but that it's down to like there's overthrows, there's underthrows, there's poor calling, there's poor lifts, there's poor movement um, in the lineup. So there's several different things going on. But um, one of the interesting things at play this week, uh, I think, is that, look, there's no doubt that Orgy Snyman, the presence of him in the Leinster lineout spooked Munster a couple of weeks ago. I don't think it was purely the reason why the lineout went to pot, because like I said, this has been an issue going back to, to last season as well. But um, this week, Jason Jenkins is going to be in the Sharks, at least uh, you'd imagine to be on the bench, if not starting. And this um, Sharks pack is absolutely loaded with Springboks um, as well. So I think that's a little mental barrier that Munster are going to have to get over as well. Because look, Jenkins obviously played for Leinster the last couple of years, but he knows the Munster line out calling system, just like Orgy Snyman knew it as well. So that's something that they're going to have to deal with this week. And I don't think it's a case of you rip up the, the script and you start again. There would surely have been plenty of tweaks to the line out um, since he left. But I think a guy, a coach like Andy Kiriakou is probably under a bit of pressure, um, if I'm being honest. Um, the Munster pack, he's in charge of the Munster forwards, but the scrum is, look, it, the scrum to me is not less of a concern because you can see that the issues in the scrum are more obvious because it is a lack of power. And we've been speaking about that for about Munster for the last few years, particularly when it comes to the front row, they try to address it by bringing in Oli Yeager, but he's been dogged by injury since he came in um, last season. So that hasn't really been rectified. 
But I think the line out is something that's much more in their control because it's not about power. It's more about the technical aspect of the game, which you would imagine that Munster would pride themselves on, really. And you think back to, you know, all good Munster teams. And I think it's been brilliant to watch how Mike Prendergast has evolved the attack. And there's no doubt that they've moved uh, massively away from the game plan that they were playing under Johan van Graan. But I think there is an element of going back to basics and shoring up uh, stuff like the line out because it's such a key source of ball for Munster. You think of the, the mall, the line out. You look at the try that Sean O'Brien scored with the lovely little play from Ty Byrne. So they do have that in their locker, but they're going to have to get it right this weekend. And I think Jason Jenkins being in the Sharks um, squad this weekend could spook them again. Luke. Wish I knew more about the area, to be honest with you. I think um, probably similar to Keane, I think... Um... You know, I think it's definitely. I I probably would agree with Roundtree though on that. It's 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 within their control. It's um it's it's a tricky one because this area Ireland are having the same issue as well. You know, and um I I think you look at the some of the brain power behind the Irish team in terms of like Paul O'Connell and the, and the line out like it's 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 not a that's not the issue. The issue is whether you're you start overthinking or uh, you know you start overthinking about it. Um, you're perceived to have an issue so it gets worse and teams go after you every week. So teams spend extra time in that area on you as well. So it kind of gets worse. So I agree with Keen that I think they need to probably get on top of it as soon as possible. Um, you know, um, a couple of good games in a row, you could kind of get this sorted out and people won't say, well, look, Munster, we, we, we'll be, we won't give them ball at two, but we'll get, you know, they're, they're so good at four and six that we're just going to give them that ball and we're just going to defend it properly. That's what a lot of teams will do against really good lineouts or really good malls and, and Munster have that, I think, within their within their grasp. They just obviously need to, whether they need to simplify things or, um, you know, whether they need to co- complicate it a bit more. I don't know. It's it's a tricky one. You'd love to be in that, uh, in, in the video room with them, having a think about it and seeing what, what their thinking is um, around it. So uh, the one thing that is definitely um, that I'm sure about is that they can't it can't continue like this because you need mm. to be able to get the ball, but particularly when we're coming into bad weather as well, you need to be able to get ball out of touch and you need to be able to put pressure on other teams there too, which I think Munster aren't too bad at in fairness, but from your own ball, you need to, like you need to have some certainty that you can go to touch. Um, that's a very important thing to be able to do. And I think, you know, in the way the game is played now, the attacking mall, like it's such a, it's such an important part of the game. Like nearly every good team has a good attacking mall. They're so hard to stop if you get set well. So you need to be able to guarantee yourself good position there. And you need to be able to, um, as, as Keen alluded to, you can see there's a bit of creativity there. Um, so uh, they just need to be able to get the ball first. You know what I mean? That's that's the most important thing. So I, look, I, I back them to get it sorted. I think, um, you know, if you look at Klein, you look at Byrne, like they're probably not the biggest locks in the league as well, you know? Um, so yeah, look, I, whether they need a rethink or not, uh, I think we'll all be watching the space very closely, but they need to get it sorted quickly, I think. One point to mention as well is I, I think I'm right in saying that Ty Byrne is a relatively new line-out caller, certainly not this season, but over the last couple of years, because when you think about it, he's obviously played a lot of his uh, previous rugby in the back row, but I think that's something he's been pushed to do um at Munster, and I thought it was interesting... I'm pretty sure it was Jean de Villiers, obviously the former Springbok and Munster Centre doing the post-match interviews um, on the TV at the weekend. And, you know, he was asking Graham Roundtree, did he think like the captaincy, you know, Ty Byrne taking over the captaincy, taking over, calling the line out was a bit of an issue. Um, and I think that's something that happened to James Ryan actually last season as well, that there was just a- almost too much on his plate. Because I think if you're not a natural line out caller, and Ty Byrne, as far as I'm aware, was certainly not a natural captain in that it's not something that he's done throughout his career. I think like we probably need to allow a bit of leeway in terms of trying to get to grips with the several different aspects of both of those roles. So that's, I think, something worth bearing in mind as well. Do you think Pete should do it if he comes back in, Keen? Is that maybe a a, the, a good idea, or does Coombs or a Hearn or any is it, or any of those? Well, obviously we we probably think Pete is probably the natural guy to be calling it. I'd say. Yeah, I think when Peter O'Mahony is fitting in the team, I think he probably does a lot of the calling. But look, the the writing is on the wall in terms of how long Peter O'Mahony has left playing at the top level. I think he said that himself that this could be um his last season. So I think it makes sense to have pushed a guy like uh, Tyg Burn. I think Tom Hearn is a great shout as well, Luke because you'd imagine if he can stay fit over the next few years, he could be the cornerstone of that monster pack. So there are just a couple of things I think that are in the mix as well, Sinead, that it's not as simple as it's down to Niall Scannell's throwing or whatever like that. I think that's what Graham Roundtree means by it's not just uh, one thing. 
Yeah, and you mentioned the post-match interview there. I don't think I've ever seen Graham Roundtree fuming as much as he was. What was he like today when you were on the call with them? <laughs> I'd say, yeah, he, he definitely um, calmed down. He'd had a bit of uh, sunshine in Cape Town. Munster have actually, they've done what they usually do. They've stayed in Cape Town rather than travelling to Durban this week. They're going to go to Durban on Friday. I think they stay in the same hotel in Cape Town every time they go over there, and it's been really good to them. So they've had a bit of sun. Their, their, their hotel is on the beach. Um. But I mean, the heat that's going to await them in Durban on a very fast track, like I said, against a Sharks team that uh, is full of Springboks, um, the task just doesn't get any easier, Sinead. Oh, no, it doesn't. OK, so that game is at three o'clock on Saturday. Um, Luke, before we get on to Connacht against Leinster, um, just a word on Leo Cullen. Um, it's reported that he's set to commit to Leinster until 2027 with a new two-year contract. There was that bit of heat on him after Leinster lost their third Champions Cup final in a row last season. Do you feel this is the right decision for Leinster? Yeah, I do. I don't think there's an obvious candidate, um, you know, to to take over that role. I think they've... You know, it, it. I think it's important that they give the current setup. You know, you've got uh, Blaindell obviously in. You've got, you know, I think, uh, you know, a more settled coaching staff this year. You know, people not coming in halfway, uh, through the season and the like. Um, so I think he's the right guy to to kind of keep at the tiller. You know, just because the experience he has, he knows the the, the setup very well. Um, look, and I think he's a good leader for for the problems. He's very very well respected. Um, look, they do need to get the wins. I think everyone knows that. And they've made a few errors in the last couple of years, you know, particularly around, you know, the obvious one for me is is the selection, um, uh, you know, for, for the URC, uh, was a quarterfinal, semifinal against semifinal. Munster, I think it was, um, you know, where you don't pick your kind of your, your, your frontline guys. Um, but other than that, there's nothing really that obvious from my perspective. I think, um, you know, for various reasons, whether they don't, I think, look, they've landed on the right conclusion, I think at 10 with Frawley, that's taken longer probably than it should have. But there was different reasons behind that too. Um, you know, I think, um, you know, uh, he, he had a few injury kind of, you know, con, you know concerns as well. Uh, a few things like that that didn't help him at kind of crucial times. Um, so maybe there's a reason why they haven't come to that conclusion as quickly as maybe I have or maybe other, or say Andy Farrell. Um, but other than that, I think he's been brilliant. And you think about the kind of production line of talent that keeps coming through and he, he seems to keep bringing new faces into the setup, into the team that, that are performing well. So, yeah, no, I, I'm pleased for him. Uh, he, he's a lovely guy. He works very hard. He's a, he's a winner and uh, he's smart. So, yeah, I think uh, the right guy to be uh, in your in your organization leading it. So, um, yeah, hopefully... You know, for obviously, you know, he's uh, I'd be a little bit biased, obviously, or very biased, to be honest with you. But, um, you know, I'd love to see him get a bit of silverware. Um, I think he needs it. Um, you know, just taking my kind of uh, biased hat off and kind of being cold a little bit on this. He needs some silverware this season. He's got all the tools. He's got the, the big name signings coming in. Um, the coaching staff is now settled. So, um, yeah, it, the, the time is now for him. And uh, hopefully, you know, he, he can get the job done. I bought, uh, some anti or unbiased keen there, please. Yeah, I agree with pretty much uh, all of that. Again, I was writing about this um, earlier today. Look, I understand Leinster fans' frustration, but I always think it's um, it's a dangerous game to judge the general mood of a province or a nation or whatever by what you read online and in particular social media because they're the loudest voices. I'd be very surprised if your average Leinster match going supporter feels as strongly as some of the comments that you see online. And look, I think at times, look, supporters get a bit drunk on success and Leinster certainly had plenty of that, but look, three champions cup final uh, defeats in three years, uh, like a fourth, if you go back to the previous one, um, a good few years ago as well. But if you take the last three um, in isolation, They've each been by the narrowest of margins and against two exceptional teams. Like that Toulouse team that they lost to last year um, is a brilliant team who could have another couple of Champions Cups in them. Uh, same with La Rochelle. Like they're an excellent team as well. Leinster don't have, for all their their riches and, you know, the, the bulk of the Irish team and all that, they don't have a divine right to win the Champions Cup um, every season. I think they have taken their eye off the ball in the URC, uh, which I think has become 
such a like a, an excellent and strong competition now and Leinster haven't won it since South Africa's big teams have been introduced to the league so I think that's a monkey that they have to get off their back as well and even for the game in Benetton a few weeks ago it was interesting that um, Leo Cullen sent such a strong team to that I think maybe before that might have been a bit more mix and match but just to touch on you know the Jack Neenarbor and Tyler Blaindall point um like as much as the buck stops with like Leo Cullen's title is the head coach, but he's the de facto director of rugby. Again, I was writing about this earlier. I was at um, an open training session in Gorey RFC during preseason um, uh, before, yeah, before the season. And it was so noticeable that Jack Neenarbor was the one who was doing all of the coaching on the field. Now at the time, Blaindall was back in New Zealand for the birth of his third child, but Neenarbor was running the attack. He was running the defense. So as much as Leo Cullen is the head coach, this is Jack Neenarbor's team as well. So I think supporters who, you know, want to change at the top should probably be careful uh, of what they wish for. Cause I think back to the Matt O'Connor reign, you know, and how disastrous that was. Leo Cullen is Look, he's a continuity uh, appointment in terms of keeping him on for the next two years. But Leinster are not far away from, you know, winning that elusive fifth star. Uh, they're not far away in the URC. So I don't think it would have made any sense, if I'm being honest, to rip up the script and start again. And also, look, I've seen this notion that, you know, Leinster should have waited. The powers that be at Leinster should have waited till the end of the season to make the decision. That's not how rugby works. Contract talks with coaches and players, and again, Luke will know this, always take place at this time of the year. It's just that it's leaked out that... Um, not always, Keen. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> depends Gen depends generally, what your situation is but you know you're, in general you're right yeah gener Sorry. generally speaking you know you want to have your business tied up before you go into the the start of the new year so look the information has leaked out uh, i think it was murray kinsley and the 42 had had it first and then rory o'connor mm -hmm. um our colleague had obviously uh backed it up so like leinster wouldn't have wanted this to get out now i would imagine they'd probably be planning to announce it next year but business is going on behind the scenes and i just don't think you can wait till the end of the season and then judge Leo Cullen. As much as there is pressure on him to deliver silver, I do still think he is the man to do it. What about anything in that, Luke? No, I think he's right. Like, look, I, you know, I think they've got a brilliant, they've got a World Cup winner as kind of, I, I agree with Keane, pretty much the head coach, to be honest with you. Um, So I don't think it gets any better than that. They've got a young kind of hungry coach, you know, working on the attack side of things, who's got new ideas, who they like. Uh, you know, I've kind of sanded out a few of the guys in there um, and, and, you know, they are pleased with the the, the direction they're going. Um, so, yeah, no, like I think all, all the pieces are there. There should be no excuse for this Leinster team at this stage, Sinead. You know, even with injuries and in kind of key positions and they have a few of those, every team has them. And I think, um, you know, Leinster should be able to uh, to to uh, survive them. And I still think you know, should be able to thrive. So um, they've got all the right pieces. It's 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 on them now, I think, to go and deliver. Yeah, actually, just on um, obviously contracts and everything, uh, there was kind of speculation. Now this is just it's just speculation about uh, Ross Byrne and a a move to Montpellier. I think it was. Um, what do you think about that, Luke? Yeah, I like the move for him. You know, I think uh, he's an excellent player, really, really solid. Um, you know, I think um, you know he's he's. <laughs> He's got a nice steady head on his shoulders, you know, with a big pack in front of him. He can be he could be a really, really nice, uh, you know, kind of guy to, uh, you know, manage the game for you. Um, and, and I think, you know, while he has some drawbacks in terms of, you know, he doesn't have much of a break. He doesn't have much pace. He's still a lovely pass. He's very consistent. I think his tackling could be a little bit better, uh, but there's not most tens aren't great tacklers for the most part. You know, I think we're lucky with Crowley and um um, Crowley and Frawley in, in, in Ireland you know most guys mm -hmm. generally struggle a little bit there <laughs> just just undersized or um, you know too much other stuff going on that it's not a real priority for them but um, yeah other than that look I, I really like him I think he's a top class pro there's not that many of them around uh, around Europe um, and it would be a big payday for him um, so um, not completely opposed to it uh, not writing him off at Leinster either um, yeah you know, I, I'd love to have seen him got, he, he probably needed to get one of those high cups done, I think, didn't he really to, uh, uh, I suppose, to, to cement that position. I think it's very much open season now and there's some young talent coming up behind him. So um, interesting to see if he's the one that Leinster let go. Um, you know, Harry as well is probably a guy who, you know, 
there's definitely one of them needs to go uh, of the four. Um, I would have thought maybe Harry uh, and possibly Prendergast, but I think they love Prendergast, and uh, look, I can see why. And he's a little bit younger, so it's probably going to be one of the Burn brothers that that probably has to look abroad to get the. You need, you, need, you know, there comes a point in your career where you need to be playing, um, or if you're later in your career, like maybe Ross is, that you get paid well. Um, mm-hmm. so um, yeah, we wait and see on on, on what the fallout is. These things generally, in my experience, Ocean Aid tend to cause a kind of panic moment, um, you know, and they seem to sign on again. Um, so I'm, uh, I don't know who, I don't know who leaked this, you know, I wonder, is it someone in the camp possibly? <laughs> um, but uh, either way, if it is true, I think it will be a good move for him, you know, I think Carby looks like he's going okay over in Bordeaux, I think uh, so far, I know he had a bit of an injury, but um, seems to be enjoying life over there. So it could be, um, it could be exactly what he needs at this point in his career. Okay, well, it's all going pretty well. We better move on to the provinces as the rest of them. Um, so, Luke, five games, five bonus point wins for, for Leinster uh, so far this season. They beat Connacht 12 points to 33. Orgy Snyman, oh my God, what can't this man do? Uh, uh, another try, uh, man of the match performance, eight offloads. I mean, he's unplayable at the moment. Yeah, Keen. if you have your a little sick bucket there, there next to you, uh, we, we'll forgive you for using it. Um, actually, you too, Sinead. Um, <laughs> Munster supporters, look away. Um, uh, fighting fit all the way through as well. But um, yeah, look, he's uh, you, you can see Leinster are kind of starting to get used to him. There's still a few ones that went awry in terms of that offloading uh, ability. But um, I think, you know, if he can stay fit for the season, I think players get more comfortable around him and so much opportunity is going to open up, uh, uh, you know, where, wherever he is on the pitch. Um, so, yeah, no, he's been brilliant so far. In terms of Leinster, uh, you know, I thought there was loads to be positive about. Uh, I thought mm-hmm. Gus McCarthy, yeah, look, it was a tough day for throwing, um, but I think he's good around the pitch for the most part. Looks like an athletic guy. Uh, like Culhan, actually. I don't know what, what, what you guys thought. I thought Culhan had a few nice moments in the game. Um, you know, excited to see maybe where he his career can go he's still young and i think leinster really rate him um but um yeah look i think the look the only disappointment really out of the day was that um you know obviously frawley goes off but apparently mm-hmm. that's kind of ligament damage that maybe isn't as serious as possibly first uh we can maybe fear the worst i think but uh, hopefully he gets back quickly other than that um it was a good display, wasn't it? I thought they were, look, they still, you know, probably could have put one one or two more opportunities away. Could have been a little bit more tight in defense at times, but I'm being very picky. I think they finished the game off pretty quickly against Connacht and um, they were very, very powerful, weren't they? I mean, that defense, I think teams are really, you know, there's, I think there's only a few teams who can really cope with that kind of defensive pressure that they're putting on you. The big bodies they have, the fitness levels, um, I I think they're hard. They're a hard team to play against. They're really really hard. I think Nina Bar you can see is is uh, having more and more of an influence. And I think he's you know we we heard Caelan Dara say that after the match in Croke Park that they're getting more used to the system. Um. So um. Yeah. Look, that's the only area where I still am not hundred percent convinced it's the right thing to do against the big teams. But against you know a Connacht team, and um, that are good, that are dangerous. I still don't think they have enough for for Leinster to really pick them apart. And um. Yeah. It's my one worry with the team, Sinead, is that is that defensive system. I just don't know if it's, it, I, I I just don't know if it comes unstuck at the end of the season. You know, better conditions, uh, harder grounds, um, you know, easier to pass the ball, things like that. I, I think it can come unstuck a little bit against that. But for the moment, they're a runaway train, and I don't think anyone's looking like they're going to be able to stop them, particularly in the league. It'd be interesting to see if anyone in the um, in the cup camp. But for the moment, um, very very impressive. Yeah, I, like I'm very wary of going over the top. I have to admit because you've been we've been burnt so so many times over the last few years years by Leinster, like absolutely steamrolling people in the early stage of the season, and then when it comes to the crunch, failing to deliver. I wouldn't fully agree with Luke on you know no one touching them in the league. I think the South African teams will certainly touch them if they're fully locked and loaded. Particularly the Bulls. Look at what they did uh, to them in Pretoria um, last year. So I certainly wouldn't. I think it's a foregone conclusion that Leinster uh, are going to win the ORC. I do agree with Luke on the defensive point. Look, I think it's been super impressive and I think they've definitely made huge improvements and so much is, of that is down to, you know, players having more time in the system and being more comfortable with what's being asked of them. But I still think opposition teams, Munster did it, Connacht did it, are finding gaps through the defence. And I think when you come up against the better teams like a Toulouse, like a La Rochelle, 
I don't think they'll let you off the hook as easily as maybe a couple of teams have this season. So that would be an area of concern for me um, at the moment. Look, I think they'll, they've got a, a La Rochelle aside, they've got a decent enough um, Champions Cup pool draw. They should come through that. But I still think there's questions to be answered when it comes to the business end of the season with Leinster. And a lot of that is probably mental as well because they have built up, you know, what is it, three seasons without a trophy. Like that does start to get in your head as well. So, um, I've been really impressed. It's hard to argue with uh, 25 points from 25, but I am sort of holding fire on going over the top on Leinster until I see them come up against uh, a much better team. I think that La Rochelle gave it the Champions Cup. I think it's in January. It would be very interesting to see. That will probably tell us uh, more about where this Leinster team stand. But that said, last season they ended up beating La Rochelle uh, in the, the pool stage. Or not the pool stages, but the knockout stages. Both actually, yeah, of course. Beat them in the pool. Beat them in the pool yeah. as well. And, and yeah. in the was it the quarterfinal round of sixteen? Uh, that's but right, ended up yeah. obviously not going on to to finish the job. So that's just in the back of my head, Sinead, I think when I'm watching Leinster at the moment, as much as I have to say, I am really enjoying watching them defend. I wouldn't say that about a huge amount of teams, but I think there's a real kind of thrill in watching, you know, the wingers getting hard off the line and making the the big hits. But like I said, it is still, I think, vulnerable to you know, the, the better teams. You think of the likes of an Anton Dupont, I think, would really uh fancy his chances of picking that apart. So um look, that's that's probably a conversation for another day in terms of getting to the business end of the season. But uh that is something I think to be wary of when it comes to maybe going over the top on Leinster at this stage of the season. Yeah, no, that's fair enough. Um, Luke, what about Connacht? Um, because that game against Leinster was the first time this season that they didn't get anything out of the game. Um, it looks like Mac Hansen will be back for Saturday's game at home against the Dragons. So two wins, three defeats for them so far. And Pete Wilkins has been playing up the importance of this game against the Dragons because, of course, the URC takes a, a month a month's break now going into the international uh, window. Like he's saying, it's red alert you know, in terms of how they will view this block um, after this weekend's game. So it's a big game for them at home against the Dragons this weekend as well. Yeah, look, it's a big game for them. I think they can probably chalk that one off a little bit, um, you know, against uh, against Lens. That was a big ask for them, I think. Um, mm-hmm. I think he's right to focus on, on the Dragons one. It'll give them a good feeling going into a nice break. They can, they can kind of rejuvenate, you know, rethink on maybe some areas where I think they could be a little bit better. I think defensively is an area where, look, it's been fairly obvious since the start of the season. They're still a little bit too leaky there for me. Um, and, and I think they'll find it hard to really outscore teams every week. Um, but I do think uh, from an attacking perspective, they are excellent on the eye. They're really, really, yeah. they are dangerous. They've got lots of quality. They've got, you know, that little bit of bulk and power. You've got, you know, the, uh, you know, combined with some, you know, some really good thread out wide. And the two guys at nine and 10, if the pack isn't going backwards, if they get a little, you know, if they even get parity, they are very dangerous. That was a tough one for them uh, on the weekend against that Lancer pack and that Lancer defense. But they won't come up against that every week. What is important is that they bounce back quickly. And I think they've got the potential to do that. I think there's loads of things that they can kind of take out. Like they, they did trouble Leinster from time to time, couldn't finish much, but they did make a few breaks, as Keen mentioned. Um, and that is like, look, even, even if Leinster have done that fairly consistently throughout the season, given a few opportunities to some teams that they haven't been able to take or Leinster have scrambled well, however way you want to look at it. Um, I, I still think it's, it's, it's still pretty hard to do. And Leinster would have been up for that game. You know, it, it was an interpro. So, um, There'll be a few things that they look at and they say, okay, we need to be better there. But there's also a few things they can take from that and say, well, look, if we can deliver that, if we're a little bit more accurate here and there, if we kick an exit a little bit better from our half, um, you know, we'll be we'll be a threat. And we can really, you know, we can put, I think they should be looking for a bonus point against the Dragons at home. I think they're very capable of it. They've got the threat behind the scrum. Um, and I think they've got the, the like, it's still a fair, that front row is still a very experienced front row for the most part, you know. And I think, um, you know, even, uh, you know, the, the I, I like their back five. I think they're quite uh, athletic. Um, so if they can, you know, get a, get a bit of rhythm in the game, bit of, get a bit of momentum, um, you know, I think they're, um, they get those two halfbacks going, going forward. They've got loads of threat to put, uh, put uh, Dragons away at home and I expect them to do that. And it's important that they do because there's nothing more bitter than that, uh, that pill you have to swallow if you lose that last game before yeah. the team breaks up. No one wants to do that. So good feelings going into that um, will help them, I think, on the other side when the international um, uh, windows is, is closed. Can you mention Cottle Ford earlier, was it? 
Yeah, I just I I was surprised really that he wasn't starting. Like I I mentioned about you know what position he's going to play long term. Obviously, he's been switching between ten and twelve, and when Bundyaki is fit and more importantly available, because his game time is obviously significantly limited in terms of what he's going to be doing with Ireland in November, and you'd imagine the Six Nations. Um. But I think you have to find a way to get Carl Ford into the team. Um, I really, really like him. I think he was excellent mm-hmm. last season. I think he started the season very well. I mentioned that he reminds me of Frawley, not just because he can play 10 and 12, but he's a nice big stature. I know Luke is touching it and he mentions it several times about the comfort of having a big 10 um, in your defensive line. And he's a big lad. Uh, he think he kicks very well. Look, I think he'll be... He'll be disappointed with the mistake off for the Andrew Osborne try at the weekend. I think he just fell asleep there, which was pretty poor. But other than that, I think he's been really excellent. And like I mentioned, I think he'd be a good guy to have in around the Ireland squad, mm-hmm. even if it was as um as a, a training panelist or, or whatever you call it. But because I still think as well as Ben Murphy and, you know, Josh Uani, like, He's been very hit and miss, if I'm being honest. I think he's great to watch when he makes the breaks and, you know, but his kicking has been pretty poor. And we touched on this with Jack Crowley. That's the bread and butter of Annie 10. Um, I think it's been interesting to watch um, Jack Crowley sort of being totally, or sorry, not Jack Crowley, Jack Hardy be totally sidelined. I mean, that's last season's uh, captain who I thought he played pretty well, actually, against the Scarlets, I think it was, a few weeks ago. Um, and look, I can understand why Leinster go, or Connacht are going with Ioane because they want to play, you know, this fast attacking ball. But I think Kyle Ford would actually be worth a look there, an extended run in that 10 shirt, particularly if they are going to have Bundy Aki at 12. That would be a really nice comb- combination, I think, Ford at 10, uh, Bundy at 12. Because like I said i just think this guy looks uh looks too good to not have in your team for the biggest games and last weekend was one of those and yeah, he's got sure. he's, well, they want to play that game as well Sinead like they've got Hawkshaw in there as well who's played a little bit of 10 from here you know from from time to time or a bit of 12 at least anyway um so i think he's another guy who could take you know he he still gives you the option to play that running game say mm-hmm. uh for t- does go down with it to keep the shape going so um, that's a good point Keane's making. I do think Yuani, though, is, he is an exciting player. And it, look, I do think, though, the kicking has to improve. He was very shaky. He's, he's kind of been shaky on that side of the ball um, so far this season. But like you do, like, I, do you know what I was impressed with? I was impressed with Bolton. I thought Bolton looked very physical. Oh, yeah. the weekend. He's quick, isn't he? He's strong. Uh, Cordero as well. Look, he, look, Cordero is still a little bit older, but he's still got that dangerous streak in him, hasn't he? So, um, yeah, I like that kind of back line. Uh, interesting to see if they do look for a little bit more solidity on the kicking side. Um, and it would be nice to see Ford get a run in there somewhere. But at the moment, it's, um, yeah, like he wouldn't be shifting Bundy. And Bundy can only play 12. I think we've, we've seen for Ireland, um, you know, that he's he's certainly not a 13. Where his real, you want him close to the ball, you know, causing problems for you. Big hits, big carries, offloading. And he does have a nice passing game too. So, um, for the moment, hard to see where he's getting in uh, other than 10. And obviously the new talent coming in, I don't know whether they spent a lot of money or not, but they'll probably want to see him for another couple of games at least. So um, for the moment, you might have to be uh, happy with uh, a bench role, an impact role, if you like. Yeah, actually, Bolton was quite good against Ulster as well uh, the previous week. We're going to finish on Ulster, um, Luke. And just a question about Jacob Stockdale. Um, So the good win over the Ospreys last weekend, 36-12. And he's been just reminding everybody of his class over the last few weeks. He scored two tries last weekend, one chalked off. He scored an excellent try the previous week in South Africa. He's kind of come out and said, look, that is big personal ambition for this season is getting back in the green jersey. Um, I know he didn't make the World Cup squad, but he was brought back in for the Six Nations he was on the squad for South Africa I, I've always got the feeling that Andy Farrell really does believe in him even though I know he didn't make the World Cup last year Luke yeah look and I think he's got some fairly stiff competition in James Lowe doesn't mm. he like um, James Lowe just has that left boot and that kind of uh, that bit of X factor you know offloading that kind of bit of strength um, he, he's kind of a bit of an all-rounder and he's really improved his defence and that's probably still the one area for me Sinead where I probably just haven't seen enough of an improvement for him to displace uh, James Lowe. But look, certainly, you know, he he's great under the high ball. He's lovely to have there. He's a nice big guy. So Farrell will like that about him. Uh, he's a physical carrier. You can see he's got the deaf skills as well. The lovely chip over the top, as you mentioned, uh, in South Africa. So, yeah, look, good to see him coming into some good form. I think you're right. I think Andy Farrell does like him. Um. I'm still a little unconvinced about uh, on the defensive side, and I probably just haven't seen him against teams where I'd really be judging him harshly enough. Mm-hmm. But certainly, 
Good to see the confidence levels up. Good to see him back playing well. I think Ireland, particularly in the back three, you know, it's nice to see some homegrown talent, I think, um, you know, playing well there. You know, Munster, obviously, with Nash and O'Leary, um, uh, sorry, Daly back on the weekend. Um, so we are still producing one or two, should I, that are that are good players. Uh, Stockdale is a top talent. And, um, yeah, no, I, I, you know what? I feel like he's. it's been a really tough period for him. He's had, you know, injuries, getting dropped, all those kind of things. I'd love to see him get, like, a nice run, a whole season, you know, in the Ulster jersey. Uh, hopefully, you know, clip off one or two games with Ireland. I think he probably was very close, I think, towards the end of making a push to get in that World Cup squad. I don't think that was that far away in the end. Um but um, yeah, I think I'll be I'll be watching him a little bit more closely. He hasn't done enough in my mind to get into the team, um, maybe into the squad. Not a hundred percent on that, but um, yeah, I I, I want to see a bit of consistency. I'd love to see you know twenty games in a row for Stockdale, no injuries, um, and I'd love to see that kind of talent and confidence shine through. He was always such a confident player when he was playing at his best. Yeah, keen. Yeah, I think on a, on a human level, even, it's just brilliant to see him back playing with a smile on his face. I mean, when he would, broke onto the scene in 2018 and broke the Six Nations try scoring record, you thought this guy could become the all-time try, top try scorer for, for Ireland. And it's been a tough few years, uh, like Luke has said, between injuries and being dropped. But I would agree, I agree with the overall sentiment of Luke's point. I still think he's got work to do to prove to Andy Farrell that his defensive capabilities um, have improved significantly enough to hack it at test level. Because I think if you put him in, like let's say against the All Blacks, for example, I think they would absolutely go after him. Um, if guys like Jimmy O'Brien, I know he hasn't been fit. Mac Hansen is fit, is sh- should be fit yeah. again. I know he was out last weekend. I think Calvin Nash, by and large, has done very well. Um, so Ireland do have options there. I would expect him probably to be in the squad. And again, I look at that Fiji game, might be a nice game for him to get some game time. And if he did score a try, you know, it would be great to see him, you know, rediscover that form. But I don't think there's ever been a doubt about Jacob Stockdale going forward and his ability to to score tries. But defensively, I still think there are some question marks there. Um, and like as well as he played against what is a really poor Osprey side who look are absolutely decimated by injuries. I'm not sure like that's going to be enough to force Andy Farrell's hand. And like Luke has said, like James Lowe like just owns that uh, mm. uh, left wing spot and he more than merits that as well. But again, like almost to bring it full circle, Sinead, like we said about Jack Crowley and Kieran Frawley, it's great to have the competition and the more of that you have, the better it bodes well, I think, for Ireland going forward. Okay, that's it, lads. Is anything else before we wrap? Well, I think it was a good win for Ulster. For You know, I think they've oh, been yes. under pressure. I think it's a really difficult yeah. job. Um, I, it was a funny interview afterwards. I don't know if you saw it with uh, with Doak, young Nathan Doak saying they were going on there for a few beers after Richie was saying, uh, oh, I didn't know about that. Clearly he didn't get the invite. Uh, so he must be ruling with an iron fist that they're not telling him. But um, no, look, I think just it is important to say, I think, like that was a good win for them. My Ospreys aren't great yeah. in fairness. They're kind of struggling a bit, but um, you know, Richie Murphy's a difficult job there and that's a big lift for them. They need to be, one of those teams at home that's really, really hard to beat. And they always were that, I think. So they need to get that back a little bit. I think that maybe wasn't as hard a place to go to the last couple of years. Um, so that's another good step in, in the right direction because we need all four provinces firing on all cylinders. So um, that was a good result for them. Yeah, for sure. Uh, they're away to Cardiff at, at uh, Cardiff Arms Park on Saturday with a 7.35 kickoff. Luke and Keane, thank you very much uh, for that. Uh, there'll be plenty more rugby chat on Indoor Sport with Joe Malloy this week, so keep an eye out for that. Uh, we'll be back again next week, but for now, thanks for listening.